much, John. I appreciate that introduction. Uh, a few weeks ago at one of these uh, con state conventions, the fellow came up to me beforehand and said, I'm the one that's going to introduce you today, and I want you to know that I'm a reporter. And so I will be concise to the point and 100% accurate because I'm a reporter. And of course, I had my doubts, but he got up and he said, our next speaker made a million dollars in the gold market in London. Here's Harry Brown. <laughs> and I stood up to this thunderous ovation. And when it died down, I said, gee, thanks very much for that introduction. It was concise and it was to the point. And, uh, However, with regard to the accuracy, I think I should make one or two corrections. In the first place, it wasn't the gold market, it was the silver market. And it wasn't London, it was Zurich. And it wasn't a million dollars, I mean, really, it was more like a hundred thousand. And it wasn't me, it was my brother. <laughs> and he didn't make it, he lost it. <laughs> So, in any event, I appreciate the introduction very much. Well, I'm sure it is no news to you that there is a tremendous revolution sweeping across this country, an anti-government re uh, revolution, and it's easy to think that this is something that has just come out of nowhere in the last year or two, but it hasn't. It's been building, I would say, for 30 years. Very slowly at first, but building and building to where it has reached a crescendo in the last few years. The depth of this revolution should not be underestimated. If you want to know how widespread it is, how deep it runs, then all you need to do is to go out into the community and talk with people. In this hotel, talk to the room clerk, talk to the housekeeping staff. Uh, if there were bellmen here, talk to the bellman. If you take a cab somewhere, talk to the taxi cab driver. Talk to your barber. Talk to anyone else. Ask a simple question. If you had your druthers, would you prefer that there were more government than there is now, less government, or about what we have now? And almost 100% you will get the answer, oh, I would like less government. But it won't be just that. It will be, oh, I'd like a lot less government. Now, that doesn't mean that all of these people are libertarians. It doesn't mean that all of these people are suddenly going to vote for us. And it doesn't mean that they're all going to join the Libertarian Party. It does mean that they want to move in the same direction that we do. And if neither the Republicans or the Democrats can deliver on that direction, then they're going to look elsewhere. Already half the American people have said that they would be very interested in looking at a third party in 1996. Right after the election in 1994, the figure was something like 51%. When the poll was taken again a few weeks ago by the Times Mirror organization, the number had gone up to 57%. Now, again, that doesn't mean that all these people are going to vote for the LP. It doesn't mean that they're going to vote for Ross Perot or any other third candidate. But it means that they no longer think only in terms of two major parties. They are now open to the idea that somebody else could come along that some, uh, could provide something better. Now, if there is an anti-government revolution going on in this country, then of course the politicians ought to be able to see that and to do something about it. But the fact of the matter is that the Republicans, after given a tremendous mandate to do something about it, are not doing anything about it. They have passed a certain amount of legislation that I would call feel-good legislation. Things like getting rid of the uh, provision that allows congressmen not to obey the same laws that the rest of us do. And we look at that and say, oh boy, I'm glad they did that. I sure feel better now because I always was burned up about that. And it makes me feel good that they finally passed that. They've gotten rid of unfunded mandates to the state by the federal government, and that makes us feel good, too. Why should they be allowed to do that? But the fact of the matter is that these things do not make any difference in our personal lives. And a year from today, when the American people have paid their income tax for 1995, in April of 96, and the Republicans have had over a year to do something, there is going to be hardly an American citizen who can look at his own situation and say, that his life is significantly better because the Republicans have control of Congress for the past year. There isn't anybody who's going to look at his taxes and say, oh, thank God the Republicans got in. I used to pay this enormous tax burden, and now I barely notice it. There isn't any businessman who's going to say, oh, thank God the Republicans got elected. Boy, those guys from the EPA and OSHA and all these other agencies used to swarm all over my business, telling me whom I could hire, whom I had to fire, uh, 
what kind of way I had to keep my books, how I had to do this and do that, and all of that is gone now because the Republicans took over Congress and set me free. The fact is that people are going to be very upset a year from now, and the Republicans like to think that Bill Clinton is going to be the issue in the 1996 election, but he won't be. The issue in 1996 will probably be the Republican Congress, and the Republican Congress will not have delivered in any significant way. Now that means that the first and foremost favorite to win the election in 1996 right now is Bill Clinton, and especially if there's a third party in the race, a strong third party, Ross Perot or a strong LP or Colin Powell or somebody else to divide the anti-Clinton vote and once again allow Clinton to win with a plurality. But the important thing is that the opportunity is there now for a new third party for someone to step in and say, the Republicans haven't done it, you know the Democrats haven't done it, Ross Perot is not offering anything that's really any different. He just thinks he can run this unreal institution better than they can. Uh, there isn't anybody that is offering anything except the Libertarians. So the question is, can the Libertarians get their message across? Well, let's look at the 1996 election. Let's look at the campaign. But let's start by looking at what a libertarian president could do. How much difference would it make if somehow, by some miracle, we could elect a president of the United States? So for the first few minutes, I'd like you to just suspend disbelief, as the dramatists say, and just imagine that by some quirk of fate, a libertarian did wind up in the White House and his name was Harry Winter. What would I do on the first day in office, the day on inaugural day? Well, in the morning, the first thing I would do is to pardon everyone who had been found guilty of a federal drug crime. The second thing I'd do is to pardon everybody who had been found guilty of a federal gun control crime. You may want to hold your applause. <laughs> this is a rather long list. The third thing is to pardon everyone who had been found guilty of any kind of tax evasion crime. I would even pardon Erwin Schiff. <laughs> now, Erwin might say, no, 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 you can't pardon me because I didn't commit any crime in the first place. <laughs> well, it's too bad, Erwin. It comes the revolution, you're going to get pardoned whether you like it or not. <laughs> and if you don't think Erwin Schiff is a gracious individual, then all I can tell you is he has sat through that remark five or six times <laughs> without ever complaining. <laughs> Well, that's what I could do uh, in the morning on the first day in office, and then break for lunch. Uh, oh, uh, there are a lot of other things also right along the same line. I would certainly get rid of all the asset forfeiture enforcement uh, in any part of the federal government. I would uh, make sure that all of the regulatory agencies that have been harassing people had new guidelines immediately that uh, anybody who harassed a citizen took property without uh, due process of law and so forth would be subject to dismissal immediately and possibly criminal charges. But then after breaking for lunch, we come back and get to work on the budget. Now what kind of a budget should the President submit to Congress? I think we probably would all disagree in this room about what the exact size of the federal government should be. I mean, we all have different opinions. There's probably people in this room who think that the budget should be zero. And there are other people who think it should be as large as seven, eight, nine hundred dollars. <laughs> Somewhere in between, they've got to compromise. We've got to stop these petty disputes. Actually, we have to come up with a program. We have to present something to the American people. And I think it's important that we do. And I think that the Republicans are failing because they have not personalized what they are doing. All politics is personal. People vote in terms of how it is going to affect their lives. The only time they vote for ideology or for looks or appearance or other things is when there is no apparent difference in the candidates between how it will affect the individual person. And the Republicans have not personalized what they are trying to do. Nobody cares whether the Corporation for Public Broadcasting is cut, except the people who want the Corporation for Public Broadcasting to stay. So they are all in Washington lobbying the Republicans, making their lives miserable, saying you can't cut the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. 
we don't want to see the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. But are we in Washington lobbying against it? Of course not, because it will not make any difference in our lives whether or not it stays or goes. The same thing with the National Endowment for the Arts and the Humanities and so forth. The same thing with farm subsidies. The same thing with any federal program. No one is going to benefit benefit personally from getting rid of those programs, except maybe one or two congressmen, maybe somebody who will get something in place of it. What has to be done is to wrap up all of the cuts into one gigantic program, to be able to present to the American people something by which they will benefit immediately. Now, the plan that I have is to reduce the federal government to one-third its present size. Now, how drastic a cut is that? Well, let's take as a benchmark or a point of departure 1950. Uh, does anybody know what the federal budget was in 1950? Anyone want to make a guess? A little audience participation here? Three billion. Three billion. Twenty million. Twenty billion. Well, it was actually $43 billion, so you're all in the right ballpark. $43 billion, and if you adjust that for inflation, you come up with something like $260 or $270 billion now. Now, that seems almost unreal in an age when the federal budget is a trillion and a half. But what happened in that government-starved environment of 1950? Uh, New, <laughs> New York did not fall into the Atlantic Ocean. We were at the height of the Cold War, and yet with this tiny federal budget and only a $20 billion defense budget, the Soviets did not overrun the United States. Uh, there were no homeless people sleeping in the streets. The crime problem was a fraction of what it is today. Nobody ever heard of teenage mothers. Uh, that sort of thing didn't exist. Welfare was not a scandal because every city had its welfare department but was so small and so self-contained that there was no scandal and it was never discussed in the newspapers or any place else. Uh, there were no homeless people on the streets badgering you for change. As a matter of fact, you could walk the streets at 11 o'clock at night or 12 o'clock at night or 1 o'clock at night in most cities, in most areas of the city, without being afraid for your life. It was quite a different environment with less government. So the fact of the matter is that going back, so-called, to uh, a budget that is comparable to 1950 is not in any way whatsoever going to deprive the American people. It's going to add something and enrich their lives, most likely, by clearing up of itself a lot of the social problems that we have today. But that $270 billion in 1995 terms uh, needs to be augmented because the interest on the national debt is a prime consideration now when it wasn't at that time, and that adds another $210 billion. It brings you up to about $480 billion. And since we're talking about other people's money and not our own, we can just go ahead and round it off at $500 billion. <laughs> $500 billion is only a third of what the federal government is spending now. Now the important thing is, of course, that as Irwin pointed out, there are all kinds of people in this country who are benefiting from the federal government of a size that it is today. How are we going to enlist their support in this quest to cut the government to one third its present size? What can we do that the Republicans haven't done? Well, the Republicans' mistake is twofold. First of all, they are trying to cut programs one by one. And as I said before, every one of them is going to create a hue and cry and no defenders of their policy of wanting to cut that particular program. The second thing is that nobody is benefiting from this in any way, any tangible, personal way that he can see. But what if we wrap up in one gigantic program all of these cuts to cut two-thirds of the federal government, to get rid of farm subsidies and foreign aid and all of these other things that are eating up two-thirds of the federal budget, and combine that in the same single program, one bill, H.R. 1 or S. 1, that includes the repeal of the federal personal income tax, so that every individual can look at that and say to himself, well, I can either keep the government the size it is now and have my pet program in there, or we can cut the thing by two-thirds and I get all of my income tax money back. Imagine a candidate for president on television. Suppose somehow we could get into the debates. Suppose the debates were Bill Clinton and Robert Dole and Harry Brown, and Bill Clinton's going on about health care and Robert Dole's going on about 
how you have to how we have to intervene in Bosnia or Russia or someplace else to protect America's vital interests because it's a dangerous world out there and all this sort of thing. And the other candidate, the libertarian candidate, simply looks at the camera and says, "This week, when you get your paycheck, I would like you to look at the study, see how much money has been taken from you by the federal government, money that you earn." that you work for and is being taken from you and you would never see under the present system. Now I'd like you to ask yourself, what would you do if you could have that money yourself? If that weren't taken out of your pay and you could use it for the purpose that you see fit, what would you do? Would you put your children in a private school? Would you set it aside for their college education? Uh, would you make a real difference for a change in your favorite charity or cause that you want to contribute to? Would you move into a better home? Would you put it aside for that business that you've always wanted to start of your own? What would you do that your money, elect a libertarian president, and that money will be yours week after week after week for you to enjoy and use as you see fit? Because only the libertarian candidate is going to give you your money back, give you your freedom back, give you your life back. Now, there's going to be an awful lot of people who say, I think that that is cold-hearted, I think that that is appealing to greed. I think that is mean-spirited. I don't know what is going to happen to the homeless and the people that are on welfare now. But by God, I'd sure like to have that money back. <laughs> <laughs> For once, we would be delivering the one-liners, and they would be taking hours to explain why those one-liners don't add up and why you can't do it that way. Instead of us having to give long, detailed, philosophical arguments to explain why it is that you can't uh, uh, make foreign countries rich with foreign aid or why free trade is in everybody's interest instead of this protectionist garbage that the president is spewing out this past week or things of this sort, we would be the ones who would be using the one-liners and say, what are you going to do with your money when we repeal the income tax and that's available to you? And they are going to have to explain at great length why it's important that the federal government stay in welfare, even though it has created such a scandal. Why it is important that the federal government stay in education, even though all that money starts in the local communities anyway, and gains nothing by going to Washington and coming back with strings attached to it. Why the federal government should be in any of these programs, they're going to have to justify all of them, one by one by one. We have the message. We have the opportunity. And so, to come back to the first day in office, that's the kind of budget I would present. But everybody would know that that is the kind of budget I would present because I would have run my entire campaign on that particular platform, on that particular program. So that when I am elected, no one will ever be able to say, I was elected because the American people thought I could deal better with Boris Yeltsin and Bill Clinton came. Or because I know more about military affairs and I want to serve in the Army and Bill Clinton did. Uh, or because I'm 10 years younger than Robert Dole, that that's why they elected me. They elected me to get their income tax money back. And that is the budget that I would submit to Congress. Now, certainly Congress is not going to roll over and play dead. But if the campaign had been waged and won on that kind of a program, do you think we could not get one third of one house to uphold the veto that I would make, I would simply say that I will veto any budget that is larger than $500 billion. I will veto any budget that includes an income tax in it. And Congress will have to override that veto with a two-thirds majority in both houses. And even if they did, the battle finally would be joined. There finally would be a battle. There finally would be two sides in Washington. Finally, there would be both sides presented on television and in the news. And we have the winning side. We have the people on our side. We have to realize that we are no longer on the fringe. That's the first and most important lesson we have to make with regard to the coming election campaign, is that we are now part of the mainstream. It isn't that we have changed, but the mainstream has come to us slowly but surely over the years. How did it happen? Well, part of it happened because of all the work you've been doing for the last 10 or 20 years, or however long you've been involved in this. Part of it is because of the work of Cato and of writers like Murray Rothbard and other people like that who have been educating people slowly, but surely, tediously over the years, and more and more people have come to understand these things. But there's another factor. 
that's at work that has brought this revolution to a crescendo, and that is that government has run out of room to maneuver. It no longer is in a position where it can just dispense favors to people and get their votes without automatically alienating enough other people to create at least a standoff, but more likely to create a negative result for the politicians. Government has run out of room to maneuver. It has backed itself into a corner where it no longer can play the same old games of politics and court that it did 10, 20, 30 years ago. We are no longer living in 1975 or 1985. This is 1995, and it's quite different even from 1992 or 93. And by 1996, it'll be quite different from 1994. Irwin mentioned that Republicans are pushing the repeal of the income tax, too. Richard Luger is. Richard Luger has a big problem with that, though, because the only thing he knows is to replace it with a 17% sales tax, because they've got to finance this trillion and a half dollar government. We don't have to finance a trillion and a half dollar government. Repealing the income tax will still lead us, leave us in a position to require some replacement for the tax, but not a 17% tax. Uh, what I propose is that we have a 5% national sales tax. 5% is a figure everybody can live with and, and can look at as a nominal figure. And so we're suggesting that we replace the 15 to 39% income tax with a 5% sales tax and pay for it by cutting the government by two-thirds. Now, it's a long time before election, and the Republicans are going to continue to move in our direction. They're going to have to. And as they do, we'll continue to move out in front of them. So maybe, <laughs> I can't tell you, maybe by next summer, uh, what I'll be proposing will be something even more radical uh, than what I'm proposing now. I assure you we're not going to go back in the other direction. That's the only <laughs> thing that I can guarantee you. But as a matter of fact, this is all happening so fast that nobody in this room has the faintest idea, myself included, what the situation is going to be like a year from now, next summer. It is like the fall of communism in, in Eastern Europe and then the Soviet Union little things. They open the border between Hungary and Austria. And my gosh, what an amazing thing. I never thought I'd see that in my lifetime. Six months later, the Berlin Wall had come down. And a year or two after that, the Soviet Union had, had cracked up. And who could have believed it? But once it finally reaches its crescendo, it goes very, very fast. And I'm not promising you that that's what's going to happen, uh, that something comparable to that is going to happen over just the next year. All I'm saying is that we should not think that right now we know how the campaign is going to be waged next year. But all of this is just a fantasy, right? Because obviously a libertarian can't be elected president. Well, I can tell you this, that I have a life of my own, and I would not have given it up if I thought there were no chance to win the presidency. Uh, the only reason I'm running is because I think there is a chance to win the presidency and make a difference. I'm not telling you I'm going to win the presidency. I'm telling you there's a chance, no matter how remote it seems now. How would we bring it about? How would we possibly ever go from where we are now to the White House in 18 months? Well, what is it that's holding us back? What are some of the things? Publicity. Publicity. What? Money. Money? Perception. The mainstream press? The perception of what? Of the party? Caring? Okay. I think those are all uh, very, uh, would you have one more? Uh, the people to actually get out there and knock on the doors. And... That, that's a very, good, that's a very good point. Those are all good points, but I don't want to hear any more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's suppose that somehow we could, by September of 1996, raise $50 million. I don't have it, incidentally, in case you thought that was going to be the punchline of this speech. Uh, but just suppose we could raise $50 million. Uh, the Republicans and Democrats will probably spend somewhere in the neighborhood of $100, $150, $200 million apiece on their presidential campaign, but they waste a tremendous amount of money. And they don't have a message. They are trying to build image, and we are trying merely to convey to the American people that we have a credible, realistic plan to reduce the government by two-thirds and get them their income tax money back. So we don't need as much money. With $50 million, if we could raise $50 million, 
we would, first of all, get the attention of the media so that the mainstream press would have to report what we were doing, would have to follow us around everywhere we go, uh, and report on every kind of statement that I make, every kind of statement that comes out of party headquarters, every kind of statement that is made by any libertarian office holder of, of uh, any stature around the country, running for governor or senator or whatever, simply because of the national campaign that's going on for the presidency. Uh, not only that, the chances of getting into debate simply by having a $50 million budget to spend on advertising and to keep our message on television before the American people, the chances of getting in the debate would be magnified many times over. But getting in the debate will also depend on standing in the polls. In 1980, John Anderson was invited into the presidential debates at a time when he had 7% in the polls. In 1992, Ross Perot got into the debates at a time when he only had 7% also. He eventually got, I think it was 19%, but at the time of the first debate, he only had 7%. Now, 7% is not a magic number. There is no uh, rule book that says once you have 7%, you get into the debates. But if we could somehow be showing up at 10 or 15% in the polls, there is no way that they could hold the debates without us. They would be too embarrassed to do so. Uh, so how are we going to get that kind of standing by that time? Well, it's going to require some kind of breakthrough event, some kind of experience that will focus attention on this campaign so that enough people will be aware of it that out of that number of people, there will be 10 or 15 percent that will say, yes, I'm planning to vote for Harry Brown rather than Dole or Graham or whoever are the contenders still in there in the summer of 1996. Now, the moment we feel that the best possible way to make that breakthrough would be in the New Hampshire primary, the Libertarian Party will have its own primary, presidential primary, in New Hampshire on February 20th, just as the Republicans and Democrats do. The Libertarian primary will be an open primary, which means that anyone who's a registered voter can walk into the polls that day and say, I want a Libertarian ballot. It doesn't matter whether he's registered Republican, Democrat, Independent, or libertarian. Now, if on February 20th it just so happens that more people vote for me than vote for Robert Dole or Phil Graham or Pat Buchanan, there will be no way in the world that we will not be part of the mainstream press and the mainstream coverage from then on to the end. Now, there is one way that we could lose that advantage once we had it, and that would be to run in the New York primary or the California primary something of that sort, but we wouldn't overdo a good thing. We'd uh, <laughs> pick up our winnings and leave the table at that point, because we'd have absolutely no chance whatsoever of scoring in the other primaries, especially when they would be so soon after the uh, New Hampshire one. But if we could pull that off in New Hampshire, even if we didn't beat uh, the Republican candidates, but simply showed up with vote totals that were right in the middle of the kind of vote totals that the Republicans were getting, would be too large to be ignored. This would be Dixville Notch, magnified 100, 200, 1,000 times over. Instead of being an event that would happen one day and get news and be forgotten the next day, this would be something that would carry forward. But how are we going to get that kind of work? Well, we're going to have to run a full-scale campaign in New Hampshire. We can't just have me go up there from time to time, give a speech before the legislature or somebody else and leave and go back and occasionally send in flyers and hope that the, the good people of New Hampshire and the Libertarian Party will go out and drum up a few votes for us. We're going to have to run a full-scale campaign. I think that it's going to take something on the order of $2 million to run that kind of a campaign in New Hampshire. We need to be there for five months. My wife and I probably will take an apartment in New Hampshire and make that our base for the five months of the campaign from September through February. We'll get a bus, travel around the state, get a press entourage uh, to go with us. We'll run radio and TV ads. We also want to produce an infomercial this summer. <clears throat> an infomercial, a half-hour infomercial that can be run on TV stations all over the state that explain the Libertarian program explain the income tax program, cutting government by two-thirds, and what would you do with your money if that were in your hands instead of the government's hands. Uh, that infomercial can be key to this whole program because we know 
that not only could we not raise $50 million out of the LP, out of its members, we couldn't raise $2 million from LP members. I'm fairly <coughs> sure. But we can raise that kind of money from outsiders who see us, like the message, and believe that we ought to be supported, even if they're not sure they're going to vote for us in November at that point, but just want to see this thing uh, get up to major status so that it will put pressure on the other parties to move further in our direction. So the infomercial will be a money raising uh, function of its own by giving the phone number, by inviting people to support us, to send checks, to call up, give a credit card number over the telephone and so forth, as well as to join the campaign and do things for us. Uh, local libertarian groups in New Hampshire can raise small amounts of money to put the infomercial on the air late at night and then the, the money uh, that comes in from the infomercial will be split between the groups and the, the Brown presidential campaign. And in this way, to a certain extent, this will be self-supporting and, and we will support, we will finance the campaign from external sources. We've already started doing that. Uh, more than half of the money that we have raised so far for the Brown for President campaign has come from non-Libertarian Party members, from people outside the party, people that uh, have heard me speak at investment functions, people that subscribe to my newsletter, who subscribe to the newsletters of other investment writers who have joined this campaign and are on the campaign committee. Uh, people like Mark Skousen, Douglas Casey, Bob Prechter, Jim Blanchard, Adrian Day, and about four or five others who are supporters of the campaign and on the campaign committee. We will have to expand that. We will need to work with gun rights groups, with nutrition groups, property rights groups, taxpayer groups all over the country to try to get that kind of external finance. So it is possible that we could run the kind of campaign in New Hampshire that would produce that kind of result. But a key to it will be getting that infomercial produced this summer. We're going to do that in the best possible way we can. We started out by figuring a budget of $10 for it. We'd buy a video cassette at Kmart, and my wife would use the camcorder, and I'd sit on the couch and, and say, well, here's what I believe, folks. Uh, then we decided maybe that wouldn't get the job done. So we thought maybe instead we need a budget of somewhere around $150,000. I hope we don't spend that much, but we're going to spend whatever we have to to do a first-class job, first-class writing, first-class production values, first-class studio, first-class music, everything that is necessary so that it doesn't look like a professional production, but it, that it looks like someone speaking directly from heart to heart to the individual watching, presenting our message and explaining what it means to vote libertarian, how that will affect their lives personally and improve their lives. Let me come back again to the point that all politics is personal. You have to personalize every message to the people who are listening to you. How is this going to change their lives? Not is it right or wrong to be giving money to foreign countries. That has to come later, at a time when we're not in the middle of a political campaign. But in a political campaign, everything that we have to sell has to be sell sold, couched in the terms of how this is going to make an individual's life better. That is the only possible way that we can over and hope to overcome the inertia that comes from trying to promote a third party. A third party that is taking votes away from the Republicans that might just put Bill Clinton back in the White House. Our message has to be very, very powerful, much more powerful than the Republicans' message has to be in order to overcome that kind of inertia. But it can be done. So anyway, it, it is funny that that $50 million, that insurmountable, job that would have to be done in the fall of 96 comes back slowly but surely down to starting with $150,000 to produce an infomercial that in turn might get us the kind of money in New Hampshire that would allow us to run a first class campaign there that might get the kind of turnout in New Hampshire that would put us in the polls, give us a standing that would then open the purse strings of people all over the country to start contributing to the uh, war chest so that we might raise that $50 million that would pressure the parties to put us in the debates, and if we get in the debates, then who knows what might happen. There probably isn't anyone in this room who couldn't win a debate from Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> Simply because we have the message and they don't. And, and don't ever forget that. We are not taking anything away from anybody. We are giving them their lives back. We're giving them their money back. We're giving them control over their own 
uh, their own families, their own schools, all of the things that they want are coming from the Libertarian Party and not from the Republican and Democratic parties. Now please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I am not promising that we are going to win the presidency. I'm not even guaranteeing that we are going to wind up with any particular percentage of the vote. What I am saying is that we have now the opportunity that we have been dreaming about for decades. And that opportunity may well pass us by if we don't act on it now. And if we do let it pass us by, America may slip to a point where it is beyond repair and where it will be impossible to recapture what we uh, would like to do. If we are going to get the American people to take us seriously, then we are going to have to begin by taking ourselves seriously. Because we are not going to get anything by default. Whatever we get in this election is not going to come to us because we the right philosophy, uh, because we are better than they are, because we are good people, because we deserve it, because we have 50 state ballot status or anything else. What we get in the next election, we will have to earn. We will have to work for it. We will have to pay for it. We will have to be smart enough to achieve the right things. And only in that way will the American people take us seriously. And if we want them to take us seriously, we have to begin by taking ourselves seriously, which means running a candidate who is credible, presentable, articulate, and persuasive. Someone who actually could serve as President of the United States. Now, if we do the right things, we can make quite a difference. We can actually put ourselves in a position where we can make a difference in the political debate for years to come. We can do the kinds of things that we have been dreaming about for years. But in order to do that, we are going to need to get started now. We cannot hope to make a difference in 1996 by waiting until July of 96 to start the campaign. By that time, the press will have anointed its own third candidate, and we won't get any attention at all. What we have to do is to begin now to establish ourselves as the third party only third choice that exists in the race. And for that reason, we are beginning next month to run radio ads in New Hampshire saying that Harry Brown is the third candidate for president. The only candidate who wants to reduce government to one-third his present size and repeal the income tax. And that is why we are producing the infomercial this summer, not next summer, and why we will have it on the air this year rather than next year. That is why I have a new book coming out in September called Why Government Doesn't Work and why it is coming out this year rather than next year. We have to do all the things now to get into position so that we can uh, have our place staked out before the general election campaign heats up in the summer of 1996. Now to do all these things, my God, I need your help. I need your moral support, I need your experience, I need your, your ideas and your suggestions. I need you to stand up for my candidacy. I need you to promote the candidacy to every libertarian you know. I need you to tell your non-libertarian friends that there's a presidential <coughs> candidate who recognizes that government doesn't work and is going to do everything possible to reduce it just as far <coughs> as it possibly can. And I need your money. If you can write a check for $1,000, I hope you'll do so and do it now because it will be far more valuable to the campaign now than it will be a year from now. If you can't afford a check of $1,000, then write $500 or $200 or $100 or whatever you can do comfortably. Don't give until it hurts. That's not the libertarian way. But give until it makes you feel good, until you feel as though you've done something to get your views on television and in the press next year. So that when Bill Clinton says, everybody has a right to health care, someone will be there to ask him whom he's going to coerce in order to pay for it. And when Robert Dole says that we have to intervene in Bosnia or Russia or Timbuktu or wherever, somebody will be there to ask how many failures we will have to go through before they will realize that we can't run the world. If we do the right things, we can make a difference. We may actually win the presidency. If we don't, we may get the 5 or 10 or 15 million votes to make the Libertarian Party permanently a major party in America and change things forever in this country. Whatever the outcome, we can make a difference if we recognize 
that we now are in the mainstream and that we now have the opportunity if we would just simply take advantage of it. If we don't, all we have to look forward to is facing the rest of our lives, seeing the kind of deterioration that's taken place over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We will see more and more of our freedoms taken away year by year, and we will see oppression grow day by day. That is not the future I see. That is not the future I want. I'm 61 years old. I figure that I have 30 or 40 years left to live. Maybe 50 if we can get rid of the FDA. <laughs> to spend the rest of my life just seeing more of the same, more of what has happened. And so I've decided to do whatever I can over the next six years to try to turn this thing around once and for all. And I hope that you will want to help me. Because if we do, maybe we can create a society in which I can live my last 30 years in peace and freedom. Live in a free country. A country in which the government does not go rifling through your bank account looking for evidence with which to hang you. A country in which government at all levels doesn't take 45% of the national income and dole it back to us as though we were children on an allowance or something. A country in which the government doesn't keep life-saving medicines off the market for dozens of years while the politicians are posing as our protectors. A country in which the government doesn't tell you what you can buy, what you can sell, who you can hire, how you can defend yourself and what you can smoke. Free country. That's the kind of country I want to live in. And with your help, I think that we have a chance to turn this around once and for all. I don't know what the outcome is, but I can't help but think that if we do the right things, who knows? Maybe, just maybe, we can make America a free country again. That's what I want to do. Thank you very much.